Well, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to First Friday. Um, my name is Carol Easterly. I'm one of the museum program coordinators here at the Kentucky Historical Society. Very glad to have you with us today. Um, do please feel free to turn your camera on if you'd like to. Uh, we like seeing you smiling. Uh, if not, that's fine. Um, and if you'll just remain on mute throughout the program, if you do have questions, uh, which I'm sure you will, do please put those in the chat box, which is uh, that little conversation bubble icon down at the bottom of your screen. Um, but we're very glad, again, that you're all with us today, um, just to kind of let you know about some uh, some of what's going on here at, at the Kentucky Historical Society. We do have upcoming programs that we want you to know about. Um, later this month, um, December 20, uh, December, I'm thinking way ahead, um, September 25th, um, our DNA interest group is going to be meeting. Um, so you'll want to sign up for that. Um, let's see here. And um, we also will have another First Friday coming up in early October. Uh, Dr. Joseph Pearson is going to be our guest and his, uh, he'll be talking about Andrew Jackson and the politics of doubt with us. Um, another thing that we do have coming up um, is our fall break camp program. Um, so if you know of some kiddos who are going to be needing something to do over fall break, um, definitely let them know about, let their parents know uh, so they can get signed up um, for that. And uh, of course, we're all kind of fingers crossed right now that we don't have to cancel anything um, with all of the uncertainty right now um, due to the Delta variant. But um, uh, grateful that we can continue to have virtual programs. We've gotten pretty good at it now. Um, so, so for most of you who are uh, with us today, I think you probably already know um, today's speaker. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, our, our esteemed KHS colleague, Dr. Chuck Welsko, um, and grateful to him for, for sharing his research with us. Um, if you don't know Chuck, uh, he is the director of the Civil War Governors Project of Kentucky, um, and uh, he's been with us since, what, 2019, right, Chuck? Yeah. Um, all right, and so he originally is from Pennsylvania, um, studied for his BA at Moravian College before going on to West Virginia University, where he got his MA, MA and PhD, um, and Chuck's also um, done a good bit of public history work as well, um, uh, doing Civil War battlefield tours and also um, at the Ford Theater Society um, as well. So uh, he quickly endeared himself to those of us at KHS by being uh, the social director of the crew, if you will. <laughs> um, Chuck started organizing what we call Final Fridays. Um, uh, the last Friday of the month, we, the, what basically anybody who wants to, we go to happy hour here in Frankfurt and have a good time. Uh, and even when we were shut down, uh, Chuck was kind enough to uh, organize virtual happy hours as well. So um, we're, we're glad to have him on the team and excited to hear what he has to share with us today. So Chuck, please take it away. Thanks, Carol. Uh, hi, everybody. It's good to see uh, a couple of faces and to have all of you here to join us for our first Friday. It's been interesting having these virtual, but I'm glad you all can join us and we can continue to talk about history and share our experiences on Fridays and cover interesting topics. And I hope, uh, kind of thinking of Joe's talk about the politics of doubt coming up at the next first Friday, I have plenty of doubt about the case I'm about to talk to you about, which I think is what makes it fascinating. We keep running into new stuff and I keep being more and more confused, which I think is maybe not the best way to start off the talk, but also I think one of the things that drives me uh, in this case, uh, a killing right that takes place. And I'll let you determine if it's a murder or self-defense, but we'll talk about this case. And I'm going to share a PowerPoint uh, to get us started. But as, uh, as Carol had mentioned, I run the Civil War Governors of Kentucky Digital Documentary Edition. That's a really long title. Uh, can you all see the PowerPoint that I have up with KHS letterhead? Excellent. Um, so CWGK, just a quick, right, quick spark notes on the project that's been around for well over a decade, uh, is a massive digital documentary edition, free to use for everybody, it has over 10,000 documents, written from ordinary Kentuckians to the state's five, and yes, I said that correctly, five Civil War governors, uh, three Unionists and two provisional Confederate governors who run the state between uh, 1860 and 1865. Uh, despite the name of our project, we actually don't really care about the five governors. The 
the t our title belies what the project actually intends to do. It tries to recapture the lives and experiences of ordinary Kentuckians during the war. Right? And the governor's office is a great place to look. These ordinary people write to the governors as the governors sit at the intersection of the chaos of the Civil War, uh, the destruction of the institution of slavery in Kentucky, uh, persistent guerrilla warfare, uh, and the mobilization of military forces, along with more mundane aspects, right? Civil appointments, political decisions, all um, remitting fines, pardoning criminals, all of these little events. Uh, and the case we're going to talk about today that I'm going to try and uh, entertain you with uh, over your lunch hour. And as I, as I go through this, I, I was told that I should mention there's a couple of times we're talking about a brutal clash in the woods of Caldwell County. Uh, I'm going to try and minimize the amount of violence that happens, but this is a somewhat gruesome affair, according to at least a few people. Uh, so just a kind of a, a warning. Uh, maybe this is not the best talk to have at a lunchtime, but I'm going to try and cut out all of the the really brutal aspects. Um, but our case will take us today into Western Kentucky, into the county of Caldwell. Uh, and I realize it's not a native Kentucky and I probably pronounced Caldwell's uh, name incorrectly. I think it's Coel, uh, not 100% sure. Uh, but we're going to Caldwell County. And we're gonna focus on one particular individual. Uh, it's gonna kind of be the, the central actor in our story. Uh, again, I'm gonna leave it up to you whether Thomas Wadlington is guilty of murder or if he is guilty of, of just defending himself in 1861, uh, in January of 1860. This snippet I have up here is the biography of Thomas Wadlington that we have created on CWGK. Not only do we have these 10,000 documents available, but within those documents, we create biographies of every individual person, place, and organization that appears within those documents. So this is just one uh, about Thomas Wadlington. And you can see kind of on the right, right, it kind of gives a basic background of who he is. He's a farmer. He's the son of William Wadlington. Uh, and William is a famous militia officer, very well known, a large slaveholder, owns nearly 40 enslaved individuals in Caldwell County in 1860. So Thomas comes from a fairly well known family. Uh, and off to the left hand side, I'll talk about this more later, but you can see what are our social networking. Every time one of these people are created and annotated in our documents, they're linked to an ever-expanding network. Uh, Thomas shows up in over 100 documents on CWGK, arguably and probably the largest single case we have about in, uh, a particular individual in the documentary edition. So from the sheer scale of what we have about Thomas Wadlington, this case is impressive. But also the contradictions and the uncertainty of what happens in January of 1860 is also really exciting. But well, what does happen? Let's, let's dive into, into what happens on January 17th, 1860. I have here a map from Edmund Howell, uh, sorry, William Howell Edmonds, an attorney in Caldwell County, a couple days, made a couple of days after uh, Thomas Wadlington meets with his neighbor Milton Cartwright in Caldwell County and they clash and Cartwright ends up dead, right? Burying the lead here, right? Milton Cartwright dies. Um, but Edmonds lays out this map to try and help uh, local, the local attorneys determine what actually happened. Uh, so he identifies the main road that bisects the Wadlington and Cartwright homes, the old Hopkinsville Road that runs from Princeton, Caldwell County, down to Hopkinsville. Uh, the, Wadl the Wadlington house lies on the north side of the, of the road. Uh, you probably can't see it there. I wanted to try and draw your attention to a couple of things and off sort of the edge of the map uh, will be the Cartwright house about 400 yards away. Uh, the principal people that are involved in the clash on January 17th are Thomas Wadlington, his son William Wadlington Jr., and two enslaved individuals. We know their names are Jordan and John, and they're mentioned in the court records uh, extensively. About 400 yards away, as I said, from the Wadlington abode is the Cartwright household. It's a bachelor pad built by Milton Cartwright about 18 months before this clash, maybe 18, 20 months before the clash. Uh, Milton Cartwright has hired two individuals, John Prince and James Blaylock, to timber wood and work the fields for him. So these seven men are going to end up meeting uh, about a quarter of a mile down the road uh, on a piece of property that lies right on the edge of Cartwright's land and what belongs to Thomas and his wife, uh, Wadlington property. So Thomas, William, Jordan, and John uh, make their way down to this spot of trees early in the morning. And throughout the day, they walk back and forth. 
Eventually in the afternoon when they cut a tree down, Milton, Prince, and Blaylock will come over and confront Wadlington. They talk, they exchange heated words, and if this was a movie, right, the camera pans back and you hear increasing shouts, and then a barrage of gunfire. At least a shotgun and a series of pistols that go out. Uh, there's screams. Eventually John Prince runs off towards the home of Eli Nichols. And not long after that, Thomas Wadlington comes limping out of the woods, bullet wound in his leg, carried by his son, or at least not carried, but kind of helped out of the woods by his son. He goes to Nichols' house for medical attention. Uh, Blaylock runs off in another direction, and presumably John and Jordan follow their enslaver over to Eli Nichols' home. Uh, Milton Cartwright remains behind, bloodied and battered and broken, lying, uh, bleeding out in the woods in Cartwright County. So how did we get here? How do we get to the fact that Thomas Wadlington kills his neighbor in uh, a heat of passion or whatever, whatever we want to call it? Uh, to get there, I want to wind this back and take us through some family history and show some social connections uh, and really delve into why we're talking about Wadlington. Uh, Wadlington, the, slave, the enslaved man Jordan, and his son William Wadlington are all going to be arrested and charged with Cartwright's murder in the days that follow. Uh, we know, according to this Louisville Daily Courier newspaper, that uh, Jordan is released on a bail bond of $1,500, but Thomas and William will go to trial uh, separately uh, for Cartwright's death. As I mentioned, we have about 100 documents in CWGK that connect to the Wadlington case, and it provides us with fertile ground to draw out a lot of interpretation and information about not only Thomas and this clash, but also social networks uh, and the communities that exist in Caldwell County. So broadly, uh, there's three interweave, interwoven themes that I'm gonna be highlighting as I go through this talk. And we can certainly talk more. I'm, I'm gonna try and lay this out in a way that allows you, as I said, to draw your own conclusions about what happens. Uh, but if we want at the end, I certainly can sit here and kind of tell you based on my best guess, uh, what actually happens on January 17th, 1860. Uh, but those three themes are these rich social networks. Uh, social connections are what drives this case to go from a disagreement over timbering, something that shouldn't really end with someone being brutally murdered, uh, to a very violent convicted clash. Uh, this is also set in a county, Caldwell County is ripe with long-term violence, uh, specifically vigilante violence throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Uh, and there's also a great deal of information about the petition writing themselves. In all of the documents that I've seen on CWGK, I've never seen a case that pits two well-organized groups of individuals against one another. One group advocating uh, for Wadlington's pardon to not be executed for the murder of Tom, uh, for Milton Cartwright, for the murder of Milton Cartwright, and another group that's demanding satisfaction, demanding that Wadlington dies for his actions. So it's impressive in scale, and that scale offers us a lot of information and a lot of things that we can do or learn from this case. So I've already laid out, and I'm going to return to this map a couple of times because who doesn't love maps, especially nice and kind of faded and beat up 19th century maps. Uh, we already know that the Wadlingtons and the Cartwrights in 1860 live about 400 yards away from here, right? A simple four football fields uh, apart from one another. But this wasn't always the case. If we wind back into the 1840s, this house actually didn't belong to the Wadlingtons at all. Actually, it used to belong to Milton Cartwright and Cartwright's family. Uh, Milton Cartwright is the youngest son of James Cartwright and uh, Adeline Graves Cartwright. Uh, James and Adeline have uh, 10 children. Milton's the youngest. He's born in about 1837. Uh, this is a brief family tree to kind of lay out some of the important players in this case. I decided to not lay out every single child that the Cartwright family had, so we didn't have just an entire long list of people that I won't mention. There's already enough names that I'm throwing around in this case, and I didn't want to confuse people more. Uh, but Milton is the youngest son of James. His mother, though, uh, dies in 1844, and James remarries. He marries Mary Cartwright uh, in 1847. And things seem to be going fairly well until James dies in 1849. So I always kind of, as I think about this case, to, to lay out the social impacts that happen, starting with the death of a Cartwright, in this instance, James, is really helpful. Because once James dies, 
uh, it kicks into effect his will. And the will is where the foundations, I think, of the social tensions in this case take place. Uh, his will has four main components, right? On one hand, it's gonna clear all of his debts. That's pretty standard, right? He dies, uh, use my estate to pay off some of my debts. Uh, they're also gonna take care of his wife, Mary, and his married and unmarried children. All of the children will receive $500 in enslaved individuals and property and cash. Uh, once Mary and the children have been taken care of, the rest of the estate will be divided equally above amongst the children. And the married children of James Cartwright will receive their money first. And then as each successive unmarried child reaches uh, turns of age, it's 21, they'll receive the kind of payout. The issue isn't with the Cartwright children. It's actually with the provisions in Cartwright's will for Mary Wobbington. She'll receive the enslaved individuals that came with her as part of her marriage dowry, if you want to call it that. She'll receive some cash, and she receives about 100 of the 130 acres north of the old Hopkinsville Road. But when it comes to the Cartwright house, James's will notes that I likewise give unto her the northwest room upstairs and downstairs of my present dwelling house during her life. Should she see, should she see proper to live in it and use of passages therewith, it, therewith annexed. Mary doesn't get the home. She just gets a couple rooms in the household. Uh, the entire Cartwright home would stay in the Cartwright family. She gets two rooms and she gets some hallways to use. Now, as you might imagine, and I can kind of see Carol's eyebrows go up as I said this, right, that this isn't necessarily the greatest deal for Mary Cartwright, right? She's not terribly happy. And we know this because by June of 1850, uh, James dies in September of 1849. By June of 1850, she has challenged Cartwright's will in the Caldwell County Court. She challenges it. Uh, the court impanels a group of individuals of commission to help her come to an agreement and between 1850 and 1851, she's going to reach two agreements with William O'Hare, the executor and son-in-law of James Cartwright. Uh, and funny fact, O'Hare is actually Cartwright's uh, son-in-law twice over. He ends up marrying two separate Cartwright daughters after the first one passes away. Um, but Mary and uh, William O'Hare reach two separate agreements. The first one uh, in late 1850 is that she will receive all of the land north of the old Hopkinsville Road including the Cartwright household. There's no division of the house. There's no just a couple rooms and some hallways. She gets the entire thing. At the end of 1850, she also brings Thomas Wadlington into the story. Mary remarries. She marries Thomas Wadlington, who has lost his first wife. Uh, and he has one son, William Wadlington Jr. with uh, his other wife. We don't actually know her name, but um, Mary now has positioned herself to take over the Wadlington, uh, sorry, the Cartwright household. She brings Thomas in, and interestingly enough, she's kind of the centerpiece here. She's both stepmother to Milton and William Wadlington. Uh, the other provision will be Mary's going to get part of the land south of the old Hopkinsville Road. So we've got Thomas, Mary, and William who have moved into the old Cartwright, now turned Wadlington household. Uh, they gain all of the land north of the old Hopkinsville Road, about 130 acres. Um, a sizable portion of land. Uh, they also will gain access to at least 15 acres, property rights to 15 acres of land on the south side of the old Hopkinsville Road. Uh, specifically in 1851, they're going to reach an agreement where uh, they get that land and also timbering rights. This is going to be important as the Wadlingtons will claim these 15 acres are their property and where they can timber, regardless of what anyone in the Cartwright family will say about it. And that brings us to Milton Cartwright. And if we flip perspectives for a moment, right, we've taken this kind of wobbling to angle. How might Milton Cartwright feel about these circumstances? We don't have documents that indicate, right, but there's no diary that says Milton Cartwright, Milton Cartwright has, right, where he's penning, man, my stepmom's being a total jerk taking my family house, right? But between 1849 and the early 1850s, things don't go terribly well for Milton. He was about 12, 13 when his father died. He's now lost both of his parents. Uh, he watches as his stepmother challenges his father's will, takes the family home. He and his other siblings that aren't married are sent off to live with William O'Hare. So they've lost their father. They've been more or less shunted out of their family home. And then in 1852 and 1853, three more of the Wobbling, uh, sorry, the Cartwright siblings will perish uh, from a variety of situations. Uh, 
It's not impossible to reason that as Milton comes of age in, uh, at age 21, around 1857, 1858, that he feels at least some bit of resentment or discontent with his lot in life. When he turns 21, he gets the payment from his father Bill and he uses that money to buy out the remaining interests of his siblings and acquire the remainder of the Cartwright property south of the old Hopkinsville Road. Uh, as the map lays out, I'm uh, not 100% sure exactly on the map where all the Cartwright property is, but the key contention here is that line over where the clash happens, right? The, the red box I showed you earlier. Uh, the Wadlington piece of property abuts, as the, uh, as the agreement says, right around where a lane begins and proceeds down the road from there. So you kind of have the two Cartwright and Wadlington properties abutting next to them. You have the possibility for tensions between Milton and the Wadlington's. But according to Mary, when, when Milton moves in, everything's perfectly fine. In 1861, she writes a letter to Brian McGoffin kind of laying out the situation that happens. For the first 18 months, Milton Cartwright and the Wadlingtons have no issues. Uh, they, Milton builds a bachelor pad, like I said, about 400 yards away from the Wadlington home, his old family home. And according to Mary, all, opportunity, all matters of friendship and neighborship proceeded as they should. They had no issues. Until one night in October of 1859, Milton rides out into the road outside of the Wallington household and calls for Thomas. Thomas comes to the front door and the two of them begin to talk. Mary summarizes the talk as one full of uh, threats from Milton that leave her feeling that her stepson is depraved. She weeps for his depravity from this conversation, the threats and insin uh, insinuations he makes about uh, Thomas Wallington. The specific conflict is that spot of land south of the old Hopkinsville Road. Uh, and he's asking Wadlington to stop timbering on that road or he's going to stop him from doing so. Over the next couple of weeks, this conflict continues to simmer. Someone, it's unclear who, shoots at the Wadlington household several times, forcing Mary and Thomas to board up the front of their house. Mary doesn't say who she thinks it was, but there's definitely that wink, wink, nudge, nudge, probably was Milton who's firing at the home. Uh, Milton will come at another time and more explicitly threaten to kill Thomas Wadlington if he continues to timber south of the road. Thomas will go into Princeton, Caldwell County, the Caldwell County seat, and try to secure a peace warrant. Uh, essentially, he's asking the court to arrest Milton Cartwright before he can commit a crime against him and assess the situation. In case. If we're gonna think of, um, Think of this not so much as a restraining order, but an attempt to get the court to intercede on Wadlington's behalf and prevent something from befalling his family. Unfortunately, the court kicks out this peace warrant. And this moves Wadlington into what is actually fairly familiar territory in Caldwell County. Uh, Caldwell County itself is a county divide, deeply divided, according to historian Christopher Waldrop, and also one racked with violence. Uh, these divisions are deep and they run both politically, socially, and generationally. Uh, and violence is persistent. Uh, Waldrop notes from the, throughout the 19th century, Caldwell County residents often rely on regulators or uh, essentially vigilantes to enforce the law, often feeling that the court fails to protect them. And this is that situation where we'll see Thomas Wallington, right? He goes, he tries to go to the court to follow legal means, right? I own this property and my family owns this property. We have the right to timber. This man is threatening my family. Please stop. And the court essentially throws up their hands and doesn't do anything about the situation. And there's also these deep divisions that lie in Caldwell County. Uh, Waldrop points out that uh, political forces, uh, I've got from KHS's digital collection, some uh, images of campaign ribbons from Henry Clay's run in 1844 to be president and from the 1856 presidential campaign that house, uh, sees Pennsylvanian James Buchanan and Kentucky native uh, John Breckinridge run and eventually win the presidency. Democrats and their Whig rivals are deeply divided in Caldwell County. And even after the Whig party on the national stage falls apart in the early 1850s, uh, Whigs maintain their opposition to the Democrats long, long into the Civil War, well until 1846 and, or no, 1864 would help if I could actually get numbers correct, uh, but well into 1864 when it's clear that the Civil War is destroying slavery, only then do we start to see 
shifting boundaries of the political landscape. But the county is deeply divided politically. We also see these deep divisions uh, generationally along the borders between the North and the South uh, and the coming eve of the Civil War. Uh, younger, the younger generation, North and South, that has grown up seeing uh, sectional tensions, conflict between Northerners and Southerners pull apart and they are more in favor of drastic action, right? Uh, Waldrop notes that the younger generation in the county leans heavily Democrat and also leans heavily pro-secession. Uh, these are trends that will continue through the Civil War as Caldwell County is deeply divided close to the Jackson Purchase, uh, what Barry Craig calls the South Carolina of Kentucky, right? an area deeply committed to secession and willing to uh, try and lead the charge out of, lead Kentucky out of the Union when the Civil War begins. Uh, Right, and there's this age difference between Wadlington and Cartwright. We know Wadlington is a Democratic operative. He's elected on several occasions to represent Caldwell County at state conventions. Uh, we don't know Cartwright's opinions, but we know there's this age difference. Uh, we're hoping as time goes on, right, being able to use these petitions that we can figure out if a generational component with 750 to 1,000 people who are signing these petitions, if we can try to track some of the patterns. Um, and I use this, uh, postcard in the center, uh, talking about Kentucky's fame. That's from the Ronald Morgan postcard collection at KHS. We have it digitized. Um, it's highlighting a number of things, right, that are famous for Kentucky, bourbon, horses, and in the center, riding through a tobacco field or a bunch of armed men under the shadow of night. Uh, these men aren't identified, but it's possible that they are uh, regulators or what would become known as the night riders in the early 20th century in the Black Patch War that involves Western Kentuckians especially in Caldwell County, Western Tennesseans, involved in conflict over tobacco between big business and farmers. Again, the image isn't identified that way, but I needed something that tied together to show off a bunch of people riding at night with either really bushy white beards or white masks tucked up against their face, uh, clearly laying along the side that shadowy nighttime rides are almost as popular as horses and bourbon in Kentucky, laying uh, at least some indication that they're it holds a central place in Caldwell County or Kentucky's long history. These divisions and, and the feeling of discontent are driven home, uh, or possibly Wallington's isolation are driven home on January 16, 1860. Uh, that day, uh, two events happen that precipitate the crisis that comes the next day. Uh, first, William Wallington, Thomas's son, and their enslaved uh, person, Jordan, have gone off to timber. They've gone off to timber land and they're confronted by Milton Cartwright. Uh, Cartwright arrives and threatens to whip William Wadlington a thousand times. Uh, possibly hyperbole, but certainly a very violent statement. And so uh, Cartwright's arrival compels Jordan and William to flee. Uh, they leave the scene of the timbering and they return to the Wadlington. Well, while they return, Thomas is out in Princeton, perhaps conducting political business. You know, in January, he's elected to head to Frankfurt again to represent the Democratic Party in Caldwell County. But while Wadlington is there, he encounters two brothers, uh, AJ and Patton Lane. And both of them recount a conversation that they had had with Milton Cartwright several weeks earlier. Uh, and they both summarize in their court testimony that Cartwright had said that Cartwright, quote, would be God danged if he did not die first before Tom Wadlington should cut any more to me. So imagine being Tom, Tom Wadlington. You're in. You're in Princeton, you're going to a political rally, you run into two community members throughout the county. They tell you that the guy who's been harassing you for several weeks, several months, is willing to use violence to stop you from cutting timber or is willing to die to prevent you from cutting timber. You return home to then find your son come to tell you that that same man has threatened to whip him a thousand times. Again, probably hyperbolic, but is threatened to enact violence now on his family. All of these situations, the peace warrant being thrown out, uh, Wadlington feeling frustrated about that, his son being threatened, hearing the possibility of violence being used against him or enacted against him, sets up what happens on January 17th. So the next day, Thomas is going to go with William and two enslaved individuals, Jordan and John, as I noted earlier, and I'll dive into a little bit more depth of what happens here. Um, and this is where I give that warning that I'm going to talk a little bit about the violence that happens on January 17th. So hopefully 
I've waited long enough and you have finished eating at this point and we've moved past, uh, it's not that bad. I'll be very quick about it. Um, but on the morning of the 17th, Thomas and William, they head out with their two enslaved people uh, to cut down timber as they had been doing the day before. They go with the normal accoutrement right, to cut down trees. One of the enslaved men drives a wagon. Uh, they have several axes and of course, a shotgun and pistol, because to walk a quarter mile down the road, what you need is a shotgun and pistol to protect yourself. Um, they spend the day going back and forth between the Wadlington home and the space where they're going to cut timber. Prince and Blaylock, as I have on the map, are there by letter D, timbering themselves. They're cutting down timber to make fence rails for Milton Cartwright. Uh, they note at every time they see Wadlington walking back and forth between his home, he is carrying that shotgun. He is clearly prepared, uh, as Eli Nichols will add later, it's very unusual that Wadlington is armed. He doesn't walk around his property or down the road carrying a shotgun. Eventually, after the Wadlington's have had lunch and they return, Milton Cartwright will show up. He brings food for Prince and Blaylock. And as they're sharing a meal, they will hear the crash of a tree. Milton, with a pistol concealed in his pocket, will turn to Prince and Blaylock and he will note uh, that he, did, he wanted them to come with him because, quote, he didn't want Wadlington to have Wadlington to have all the law on his side. So Cartwright is asking for two witnesses to come with him. He doesn't, Prince and Blaylock don't add to what that means, but we can infer that he wants witnesses. He wants someone there with him as he goes to confront Thomas Wadlington. It's clear from Wadlington carrying his weapons, Cartwright asking for witnesses, that both men at least have some notion of what might be coming. They're expecting some type of confrontation. And that's certainly what we get. Uh, when Cartwright, Prince, and Blaylock arrive. Uh, as I noted earlier, Cartwright and Wadlington begin exchanging words. Cartwright wants to know what he's going to do with the tree. Wadlington says he's going to cut it up for firewood. Cartwright gets angry, and <laughs> every side agrees that at this point, Cartwright puts himself between the tree, sitting on it, and William Wadlington, who has an axe to cut the tree. Every time William moves to try and cut the tree, Cartwright will get up and put himself to sit down on the tree, moving it back and forth. But two divergent narratives take place here. Prince and Blaylock note that in the middle of this argument and conversation, Thomas Wadlington simply snaps the shotgun to his shoulder, fires a shot in Cartwright's chest. Somehow, Cartwright draws the pistol from his pocket, fires and hits Wadlington with it. And from there, Wadlington charges, drawing his pistol, firing, starting to bludgeon Milton Cartwright. Prince, incensed at this, says that he runs forward and takes a swing at Wadlington. He misses, and then Jordan and William attack Prince. Uh, he notes that Jordan, the enslaved man, swings an axe at him and uh, William starts scuffling with Prince. This compels Prince to run off toward Levi Nichols's house while Thomas and William finish off Milton Cartwright. The Wadlington conversion is subtly different. They argue that Cartwright shows up. He begins arguing. He puts himself, he interposes himself between William and the tree, but then suddenly he springs up from the log, draws his pistol, and aims it at Thomas. Thomas begins to retreat asking Cartwright to stop, to, uh, to not shoot him, but Cartwright fires, and then Wallington returns fire. And incensed by the fact that this man has threatened his family repeatedly, he draws his pistol after he's hit uh, Cartwright in the chest, and begins to fire with his uh, pistol. He charges uh, and bludgeons Cartwright with his pistol and eventually an ax. In this instance, Prince hops on Thomas Wallington's back and William Wallington will rip Prince from his father's Back, uh, Jordan offers William an axe to defend himself, and at this, Prince runs away. These are two very different narratives, and they clearly point to two different conclusions, right? Uh, I'll leave it up to you to determine who is Han Solo and who is Greedo in this sense, right? To uh, cite the cantina scene from Star Wars, right? Who fires first? Um, the medical examiner, when he testifies at court, notes that there is no way that Milton Cartwright could have fired first. The shot that would have hit him in the chest would be mortal and also would have paralyzed him. We don't know exactly what happens, um, and I'm happy to kind of circle back to this, right? Uh, we don't know exactly who fires first, and it's the question that I keep coming back to. Uh, but we have this clash. These two men fire at one another, and Cartwright is left dying and eventually expires over timber. Uh, from here, Wadlington, as I showed you earlier, right, Wadlington, William, and Jordan are all arrested. 
And we start to receive a number of petitions uh, that go to uh, Frankfurt, Governor Brian McGoffin to help Thomas Wadman Canal. And one of them, uh, and I apologize in advance, I was debating yesterday exactly how I pronounced this guy's name, George C. Braunau is the interpretation that I'm going with. That's correct, great, if it's wrong, just add it to the list of things I have mispronounced in this talk. Um, but Braunau notes uh, when he writes to Brian McGoffin that for the last year or two, uh, the county, Caldwell County, has suffered intense excitement resulting from the lawless acts of men who could not be reached by the courts of the country. And the law of self-preservation prompted the citizens to organize companies of regulators to rid themselves of troublesome persons. Uh, Braunau goes on to note that uh, local residents had already formed an opinion on Wadlington and Wadlington was convicted, not because of what he actually did, but because people were tired of people taking the law into their own hands. Uh, and certainly, when Braunau talks about regulators, he's referring to another case in Caldwell County that takes place in the summer of 1859. Uh, another document in CWGK highlights the case of Wesley, an enslaved man from Caldwell County who was ordered by his enslaver, Jesse Williams, to murder a neighbor, uh, Edmund Stevens. As you can imagine, Wesley thinks this is a terrible idea. Why should he go kill a white man because his owner wants him to? Uh, he enacts every uh, opportunity of you know, resistance that he can. He runs away temporarily. He lies to his master. He wastes resources. But eventually, he's taken at gunpoint to his uh, to Edmund Stevens' property. Has a gun pointed at him, and Jesse Williams says, "Either you kill this man, or I kill him." Wesley kills Edmund Stevens, uh, but because the sheriff is able to follow the footprints back to the Williams' property, uh, not the cleverest way to go commit a murder. Uh, Wesley is quickly arrested. He confesses to the crime and Jesse Williams is arrested. Several months later in the summer of 1859, someone, a mob breaks into the Caldwell County Jail and drags Jesse Williams from the jail. Uh, more than likely, this is the group of regulators that Ron was talking about. They then lynch or hang Jesse Williams from a tree, kill him for upsetting the social order of Caldwell County. This is the background context of what happens in Wadlington's case, right? A few months after Wesley has killed a white man, after his enslaver has been executed for upsetting the racial and social order of, Cal of Caldwell County of the slave South, uh, Wadlington kills Cartwright. And Braunau will say that Cartwright's death is, or Wadlington has been convicted wrongly because of gross excitement on the part of local residents. And Eventually, right, uh, Wadlington appeals and his appeal fails, and he's scheduled to be executed in March of 1861. And this prompts a massive petition campaign somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, doing quick math, about 76 petitions. Uh, sorry, no, 51 petitions and 38 affidavits on Wadlington's behalf or against Wadlington reach Frankfurt. So, right, somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 plus documents. Uh, written about Wadlington go to Brian McGoffin and eventually James Fisher Robinson, his replacement as governors in Frankfurt. A massive mobilization of effort. Uh, and these petitions are, are the raw resources that we're using to build at least an interpretation of not so much the case, but the case's fallout. And I think we can start to see from these petitions, right, the, the things I was talking about earlier, we have now talking about the violence that takes place in Caldwell County. We have the deep divisions that historian Christopher Walter had noted. Uh, we start to see these divisions, or it's at least possible for us to start teasing out these divisions. Um, I'm estimating that we're going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000, 750 to 1,000 individuals sign all of these documents. Um, the CWGK team uh, is currently working their way through some of these documents, and they have a couple of them have several hundred names that are attached to these petitions. They're massive. They're fairly time consuming. Uh, but our hope is they're going to provide us with a decent amount of information. Uh, and that brings us right back to Wadlington's biography. Uh, this social networking node that you see off to the left, right, this is constructed from all of those documents. I think we've gotten through maybe, maybe about half to three quarters of them at this point. We've done a decent amount of work, and you can start to see how these documents are, are clustering out. Uh, Wadlington is that center blue dot. Uh, and all of the lighter blue dots are the different documents that Wadlington appears in. And then every single orange dot you see in there, that is a individual. 
uh, who has signed one of the petitions on Wadlington's behalf or against Wadlington. Right? There is a overwhelming number uh, of individuals who are writing asking for Wadlington to be pardoned. But again, there's about 13 petitions that are specifically asking for Wadlington's sentence to be carried out. Uh, so you can start to see, right, how these documents are clustering people together. Uh, we've got one of our graduate students who's helping us with this work, who's going to be writing on the Wadlington case, hopefully trying to trace down the, the kinship and the networking patterns, the neighborhoods, right? Does, does proximity to Wadlington um, determine how people feel about this case? Or are there other factors? Is it generational? Is it political? Um, but there's a couple of things that we can use from these petitions. On one hand, they're massively standardized. Uh, if I have to read the statement that we, the undersigned citizens of Caldwell County, Kentucky, have long known Thomas B. Wadlington, and he has ever been considered a good man and true-hearted citizen, known and noted for his industry and, and orderly conduct, one more time, I will lose my mind. This same sentence shows, shows up 38 times in these documents. Every single petition on Wadlington's behalf has this statement, clearly indicating that there is a centralized group of individuals who are advocating on Wadlington's behalf. Uh, there's also a matching 38 affidavits written by different individuals. Many of them are the same ones who are signing these documents. They're attesting to the fact that they know all the people who are on the petition. They're attesting to the fact that Wadlington is a loyal uh, citizen of the United States. A dubious proposition if we want to believe that because he's in jail the entire time the Civil War is going on and it's a little hard to infer his patriotism from behind bars. Uh, but similarly, those anti Wadlington pro execution documents uh, have a similar sentiment, right? Uh, we, the undersigned citizens of Caldwell County, blah, 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 believe the verdict of the jury is correct and they want to see, based on what they know, Wadlington be executed. So there is clear divisions between the people of Caldwell County and the surrounding counties. Uh, they're well organized and they're pushing these large and massive petition campaigns to Brian Gaunt. And not only do these petitions provide us this fertile ground to build out some interpretations of uh, who these individuals are, uh, but they also offer us um, some opportunities to see problems that lie behind uh, um, the petition writing process. For example, uh, this affidavit from Bryant Nichols highlights the fact that he has been rumored to have signed another document. He's heard word that he signed one of these documents on Wadlington's behalf, but he hasn't done that. He claims it's a mischievous forgery. Well, except for the fact that we do have a document that has a Bryant Nichols who has signed the document. Not only that, he has attested to the notary of Caldwell County that he knows all the people who signed the document. And not only does he know them, but he uh, believes all of them to be true men and he supports Wadlington's uh, case. Now, I've taken all of the signatures, screen captures, and laid them up next to one another to try to determine if this is actually Bryant Nichols. Uh, there does happen to be two Bryant Nichols in Caldwell County. One's 18, one's about 40 around the time of uh, Wadlington's case. But the signatures are way too close. So either Bryant Nichols has had a change of heart. He signed the original petition in January of 1861, and by February, he's gone. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to be involved in this anymore. Or someone's actually forged his signature. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer on that. I, I thought about throwing the signatures up and having you all take a look and telling me what you think, but I felt like that was maybe a little too interactive uh, and a little too like nitpicky about, uh, we also do this Tuesday transcription thing and I'm thinking of throwing the hand, those up there and seeing if we're gonna have people comment if they're actually the same signature. But Nichols's case points to larger issues. Uh, both sides are noting a great deal of irregularities. Those opposed to Wadlington are highlighting the fact that too many people have signed these petitions not from Caldwell County, or people with different levels of uh, mental ability, uh, or young children, infants have signed these documents claiming gross numbers of forgeries and that someone is operating illegitimately. Regardless of all the questions behind the scenes, the petition campaign works. Brian McGoffin uh, reduces Wadlington's sentence to life in prison, and he's sent here to Frankfurt. Uh, he goes to the Frankfurt State Penitentiary, and there Wadlington will arrive in March of 1861 and he stays. Now, we know from friends at KDLA, they were able to get us during uh, the pandemic a copy of the prison registry. We know Thomas Wadlington arrives there in March of 1861. 
Uh, he's also there roughly at the same time as Wesley, the individual I mentioned earlier who killed Edmund Stevens. We do also know, uh, and it's hard to see here, it's terribly hard to read the, uh, uh, the register itself, but we also know that Wobbington dies in the Frankfurt State Penitentiary in March of 1863, around two years after he had arrived in the jail cell. Uh, incidentally, to make another connection to Wesley, Wesley dies in January of 1863 as well. Um, that kind of wraps up our story, right? Wobbington uh, defends himself or perhaps commits murder. So was this something with malice of forethought? Did he go forward into January 17th planning to kill Milton Cartwright or did he defend himself in a moment of passion? Uh, we have, I, I'd say, I don't actually think that the CWGK team has differing opinions. We all kind of, we were talking about this yesterday. We have a fairly standard uh, of idea of what happened and I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that. Um, our hope with the Wadlington case is to continue coming back to this, right? We said there's a massive amount of documents. Uh, I'm waiting here, our address, discovery.civilwargovernors.org. You can access our website and all 10,000 of those documents. Uh, we're gonna be building this year with help from three graduate students. I saw one of them on this call when we started Danielle Solano. She's a PhD student at UVA. There are PhD candidates, I should say, at UVA. There are two other graduate students, uh, Rachel Nicholas, a PhD student at West Virginia University and Kevin McPartland, a PhD candidate at University of Cincinnati, who are helping us with this case. Um, all three of them are fantastic. We're happy to have them on board our team with support from the National Historic Publications and Records Commission, and HPRC, from uh, Washington, DC, part of the National Archives. And of course, Deborah Thompson is here, and our other two staff members, Haley Brangers and Sarah Haywood, uh, are both actually on vacation. I don't believe they've popped on this call, uh, but all of us have put in a lot of work and built a really awesome uh, theory or series of theories and, on the Wadlington case. And it's something we talk about frequently because I find it unbelievably fascinating. And I've also rambled on for about 45 minutes about Wadlington and his killing. Uh, but I'm happy to stop sharing the PowerPoint. Uh, you're also free. I have my contact information there to email me or reach me on Twitter. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about the Wadlington case and happy to answer any questions that you all might have. So. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm happy to talk more about this. Or not, we can stop talking about Wadlington if you guys are like, wow, this was just a crazy dude who killed somebody in the woods and we talked for 45 minutes about this. Thank you, Chuck. No, that, I thought that was really, really interesting. I'm like, this has all the elements of like a novel right here. So, you know. Oh, this is 100% like I'm trying to tap into that true crime drama aspect of like, like this would make a great podcast or like true crime like detective show that's that's how i'm going to make my millions right i'm going to write cool. the, the true crime version of this case i think uh, you know you and stewart go upstairs to that new recording studio we've got and record the historic true crime podcast for the kentucky historical society to i think it's a good idea um well so thank you and please if anyone does have questions or comments that you would like to share, please feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, Alyssa commented earlier that wa about Wadlington's will. Uh, she said, Wadlington's will has the same energy as Shakespeare, giving Anne Hathaway his second best bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's not great. And I like, I have jokingly said that I think this is what sets like, I don't blame James Cartwright for his son's death, but like, it kind of like it starts the snowball in my mind that sets up the social tension, right? They're neighbors and they're not, it's not just because they're neighbors that this happens, right? There's a lot of baggage that comes behind Wobbling and Cartwright living next to one another. The fact that the house has changed homes is just, I like the icing on the, kind of the icing on the cake for me. Um, is it clear that I'm very pro Wobbling in this? I, I don't, I tried to hide that and I don't think I've hit it very well. Oh, okay. Rebecca's shocked. So that means I did a good job. Well, You're Glenna did want to know, what is your opinion? Did Wadlington defend himself or murder Cartwright? So uh, I have clearly thrown Rebecca for, for a loop. Uh, yeah, so I think and we were talking about this yesterday. Deborah and I were talking about it. Uh, my thought is it goes something along the lines like this. I think Wadlington is increasingly frustrated by the fact that he can't get any help. He sees his son threatened, so he arms himself. He goes out that day, and he is prepared to do whatever he can to protect himself if car right if, if everything that is said based on the evidence right and i put the this asterisk here right because all of the evidence is pretty much coming from prince and blaylock and court testimony 
and then Mary and William writing letters afterwards uh, and some other circumstantial evidence. But what I think happens is I think there, there is this exchange, right? Everything is the same up until that point where Cartwright's sitting on the wall. The fact that Cartwright has his pistol concealed though is, is the key for me. The fact that he, Wadling, he takes a shot to the chest, the idea of him being able to draw a concealed pistol from his pocket, maybe he reaches his hand in and he just fires through his coat. That might happen. But the idea that he'd be hit in the chest and be able to raise and fire a shot off seems unlikely to me. Again, this is all with an asterisk. I'm making it informed to what Carol Emberton, uh, who wrote an article on Caroline Dementa, an enslaved woman that we have in our uh, digital edition, using disciplined imagination. I'm trying to use the best logic, right? The medical coroner says that Cartwright's paralyzed after he got shot. He can't fire. It's a mortal wound and he's just slowly dying. And so I think Cartwright draws, he gets his shot off, he hits Wadlington in the leg. Wadlington fires, Cartwright is affected and is kind of stunned from this shotgun blast in the chest. And then Wadlington kind of incensed with uh, all of the stuff that's happened beforehand, launches into attacking Cartwright and just, it ends that day, right? He's like, this is done. I don't care what happens. This is where it ends. It's definitely a bit manslaughter. I will give you that. Like, I, like should Wadlington go to jail? Probably, but like, I, I don't think he's going into this in, with the intention to murder Milton Cartwright. Um, I will also say that the fact that Cartwright's not at his house the night before is really interesting to me. Is he afraid that, Car that Wadlington's gonna come after him? Is he out on a bender? I have a slight theory that he might be a little hungover that day, but that's just a, that has like no basis in fact. It's just like, why wasn't he there? And they talk, uh, AJ Martin who's with talks about drinking from the night before, so. Okay. Uh, All right all theories. And uh, well, Deborah commented, uh, one thing that was frustrating uh, was that we so far have not been able to locate the names of Thomas Wadlington's mother or first wife. Mm -hmm. So she said, we tried. Um, and Alyssa wanted to know, how old was William Wadlington Jr. at the time of the killing? Um, I think he's around like 17, 18, something like that. I, I have to double actually check. Uh, but yeah, I think he's like somewhere around 17. Okay. And Jack would like to know, um, where'd it go? Here it is. Do you know if governors at the time issued many pardons? Yeah, they uh, actually, there was an article Deborah shared with me a couple of weeks ago that highlights that Kentucky governors actually might be a little too liberal with passing out the pardons. Um, it, it is noted at the time that Kentucky governors have a tendency to just be like, oh yeah, no, whatever, cool, we'll pardon, we'll remit that fine. Um, what, what's really cool from looking at all of these petitions is you can start to pick up the patterns. So the fact that there are these patterns in the Wadlington case aren't actually surprising. I, I'm not entirely sure how individuals have these pat, uh, this idea of how they frame their appeals to governors, but most people are either poor uh, destitute or the only means of support for their family, right? They're always kind of pushing themselves as being imperiled or their family being imperiled based on what happens to them. So it, there, there's definitely this pattern in structure. Um, but yeah, I do think Kentucky governors, they, they seem to hand out a fair number of pardons. Bramlett, Thomas Bramlett, the third union governor during the Civil War is actually really fascinating because there's times where he'll just be like, I'm not feeling well today, fine, pardon. Or no, you know what? Basically, the equivalent of no, screw this dude. Um, he doesn't use those words. I'm, I'm ad libbing a little bit and adding some 21st century flair. Um, but yeah, well, Bramlett at least seems to have some level of very much affected in the moment. Um, let's see. Jody said, first of all, she says that she admired and appreciated your AV wizardry with your PowerPoint there. Very nice. Um, and secondly, she wanted to know, she said the $1,500 bail for Jordan surprised me. Is that an unusual amount for the time? That's a good question. Um, usually, I think it's a little heavier, especially because it's an enslaved individual uh, from a wealthy family. I honestly don't, I couldn't give you a quote, Jody, on like what the actual average is, but I do think it's a little bit higher. Usually what will happen is, I think the situation is different with Jordan, an enslaved man accused of murder. Uh, usually they'll have other individuals bound in kind of recognizance, right? If Bob Smith doesn't show up to jail, his neighbors, John and Joe, I don't know why I picked all J names there, 
uh, will be fined for having him for this fictional John Smith not showing up. Um, but uh, oh, sorry, I just read Rebecca's comment. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, Deborah, uh, Deborah was able to confirm that William Wadlington Jr. was uh, 20 years old, uh, roughly about 20 years old at the time of the killing. Um, Chuck says he was close, but you know what? We're historians. We don't math. It's okay. <laughs> or at least yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. They're actually happy that I can't do this without making bad math. Um, and Rebecca says, I think I was confused when Chuck said pro Wadlington. I thought he meant he didn't shoot first, but Rebecca disagrees. She thinks Wadlington did shoot first. <laughs> um. You can be a guest on Chuck's new podcast and debate him on that. Um, uh, let's see. So, and we have another comment. Um, good to compare this to the Hatfield-McCoy feud a, few, a generation later. Competition over Timberlands, history of violence, petition campaigns to the governors of two states. Governor at the time was Simon B. Buckner, a major actor during the Civil War. Uh, yeah, I think the Hatfield-McCoy feud, it, in some ways I've, I've definitely thought of Hatfield and McCoy when I, came across Wadlington. Uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to perpetuate this myth that like Kentucky's just full of these small family feuds and, and it's a state dominated by, by feuds. There's certainly a discontent here, but it's on a much smaller scale. But I do, I do think you're right. There is this natural comparison to a much more well-known case. And can we highlight what are parallels, what are similarities and what are differences? But I did, actually the timbering issue didn't even occur to me that the over wood and timber in both cases. I didn't know that about the Hatfield and McCoys. Thanks, Tom. Um, say again. I said, I said thanks, Tom. Yes. Stephanie also says good point. All right. Uh, any further questions or comments that you guys have? Okay. Well, I think we should all harass Chuck about um, making this podcast or writing a book uh, or whatever about this. <laughs> so, I'll just have another book to the, to the... <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Chuck, for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. Always a pleasure for us to be able to highlight the really smart people who work right here in our building with us, um, our wonderful colleagues. And uh, do please plan to join us next month if you're able, um, as we'll hear from Dr. Joseph Pearson about uh, Andrew Jackson and the politics of doubt. All right, guys. Not murder Have during a... this time. Huh? No, I'm kidding. I'm making a joke. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Bye, guys. <laughs>